Amidst life's journey, we seek to understand the truth of who we are, where we stand. Yet our hearts deceive with pride and blind, till we confront the face of God divine. In the mirror of self we find delight, for we see virtue, wisdom shining bright. The clear evidence, a humbling guide, reveals flaws within our darkness hides. Contemplating self alone won't suffice. To recognize the truth, we must arise. To look beyond to God, the perfect one, his righteousness, the standard we must shun. The temptation of mere semblance beware, for hollow righteousness may lay us bare. Our hearts seek satisfaction, nothing more, yet true virtue lies on God's sacred shore. Impurity surrounds us, we are confined. Within this human frame, our souls are blind. A tainted lens distorts what we perceive. An eye to black a custom can't believe. In judging minds, we think we're sharp and keen. Yet in God's presence, we are made to glean. The sun's brilliance blinds our earthly sight. To know our limits, embrace the light. When earthly standards blind our eyes to righteousness, we think we rise. But looking upward to the divine, we find pure virtue, pure and fine. Our own righteousness, wisdom, and might, God's perfection pale from sight. No longer proud, we bow to grace. In his embrace, we find our place. As we reflect on God's dear throne, our false facade is overthrown. The virtues we thought we possessed revealed as frail and far from blessed. The gap between divine and us, so vast, so deep, yet through his fuss, God guides us to a humble place, his love and grace, our saving grace. In our quest for the divine, our virtues, once so pure and fine, are shown to be mere dust and grime, far from this perfect paradigm. So let us learn from this divine, to see ourselves with eyes aligned, to God's righteousness will incline, and in his grace our souls refine. Welcome back to my Fortress of Theology. I'm Jonathan, the Cage Stage Crusader. And today I'm going to continue my pilgrimage with Book 1, Chapter 1 of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, where I will cover Section 2, which continues the argument made in Section 1, obviously. You find in the description links to the Institutes, as well as additional lectures and stuff. So, <clears throat> let's dive in. Calvin writes, On the other hand, it is evident that man never attains a true self-knowledge until he have previously contemplated the face of God, and come down after such contemplation to look into himself. Such is our innate pride. We always seem to ourselves just and upright and wise and holy until we are convinced by clear evidence of our injustice, vileness, folly, and impurity. Convinced, however, we are not if we look to ourselves only and not to the Lord also. He being the only standard by the application of which this conviction can be produced. For since we are all naturally prone to hypocrisy, any semblance of righteousness is quite enough to satisfy us instead of righteousness itself. And since nothing appears within us or around us that is not tainted with very great impurity, so long as we keep our mind within the confines of human pollution, Anything which is in some small degree less defiled delights us as if it were the most pure, just as an eye to which nothing but black had been previously presented seems an object of a whitish or even brownish hue to be perfectly white. Nay, the bodily sense may furnish a still stronger illustration of the extent to which we are deluded in estimating the powers of the mind. If at midday we either look down to the ground or on the surrounding objects which lie open to our view, we think ourselves endued with a very strong and piercing eyesight, 
but when we look up to the sun and gaze at it unveiled, the sight which did exceedingly well for the earth is instantly so dazzled and confounded by the refulgence as to oblige us to confess that our acuteness in discerning terrestrial objects is a mere dimness when applied to the sun. Thus, too, it happens in estimating our spiritual qualities. So long as we do not look beyond the earth, we are quite pleased with our own righteousness, wisdom, and virtue. We address ourselves in the most flattering terms and seem only to be less than demigods. But should we once begin to raise our thoughts to God and reflect on what kind of being he is and how absolute the perfection of that righteousness, the wisdom and virtue, to which as a standard we are bound to be conformed, what formerly delighted us by its false show of righteousness will become polluted with the greatest iniquity. What strangely imposed upon us under the name of wisdom will disgust by its extreme folly, and what presented the appearance of virtuous energy will be condemned as the most miserable impotence, so far as these qualities in us which seem most perfect corresponding to the divine purity. <clears throat> now we can see nine points made in this section. So go through them one by one. Point one, the necessity of contemplating God before achieving true self-knowledge. On the other hand, it is evident that man never attains true self-knowledge until he previously contemplated the face of God and come down after such contemplation to look into himself. Point two, the inherent human tendency Receive ourselves as better than we truly are. For such as our innate pride, we always seem to ourselves just and upright and wise and holy until we are convinced by clear evidence of our injustice, vileness, folly, and impurity. Point three, the need to rely on God as the standard of righteousness and virtue. Convinced, however, we are not if we look only to ourselves only and not to the Lord also, he being the standard by the application of which this conviction can be produced. Point four, the human inclination to settle for mere appearances of righteousness. Since we are all naturally prone to hypocrisy, any empty semblance of righteousness is quite enough to satisfy us instead of righteousness itself. The deceptive nature, point five, the deceptive nature of human perfection due to our perception, due to our inherent impurity. And since nothing appears within us or around us that is not tainted with some great impurity, so long as we keep our mind within the confines of human pollution, anything which is in some small degree less defiled delights us as if it were most pure to the eye. The analogy of human perception, point six, the analogy of human perception being limited and insufficient when compared to the divine, may the bodily sense may furnish a still stronger illustration of the extent, extent to which we are deluded in estimating the powers of the mind. Point seven, the self-deception resulting from focusing solely on earthly standards. Thus do it happens in estimating our spiritual qualities. So long as we do not look beyond the earth, we are quite pleased with our own righteousness, wisdom, and virtue. Point eight, the transformative effect of contemplating God's absolute righteousness and perfection on our own perceived righteousness and wisdom and virtue. But should we be once begin to raise our thoughts to God and reflect on what kind of being he is, how absolute the perfection of that righteousness and wisdom and virtue, as a standard, we are bound to be conformed. Point nine, the realization of the vast disparity between human qualities and divine purity, so far as these qualities in us, which seem most perfect and corresponding to divine purity. <clears throat> in this passage, John Calvin highlights the human tendency towards self-deception and the need to recognize God's absolute righteousness as a standard for true self-knowledge and virtue. Through contemplation of God's perfection, of our own perceived righteousness and wisdom, we are revealed as flawed and inadequate, leading to a humbling recognition of our need for God's guidance and grace. Now let's look at each point and break down, break them down and see what Calvin is saying. Point one, the necessity of contemplating God before achieving true self-knowledge. On the other hand, it is evident that man never attains 
a true self-knowledge until he has previously contemplated the face of God and come down after such contemplation to look into himself. All people to one degree or another perceive themselves as smart, kind, and honest, confident in our abilities, and believe we make good decisions. However, others, such as teachers and classmates, will notice that we sometimes exaggerate our achievements and tend to avoid taking responsibility for mistakes. We can break the self-knowledge down into a number of points to drive home what is meant. Our perception of ourselves illustrates how people often have a certain image of who they are. We may believe we possess a certain positive qualities, but the self-perception might not always align with reality. Many, if not most of us, have a natural inclination to see ourselves in a favorable light and downplay our flaws. Now, let's say we attend a lecture where speakers share stories of extraordinary individuals who've made a positive impact on their communities through acts of kindness, determination, and humility. These stories showcase a higher standard of virtue and goodness. As we listen to the speaker and reflect on the remarkable qualities these individuals embody, we begin to question our own character. We realize that our perception of ourselves may not be entirely accurate or based entirely on the best standards. After the lecture, we take time to contemplate the idea of God or a higher power. We consider the values and virtues associated with this divine being, such as love, honesty, compassion, and humility. With this new perspective in mind, we start to honestly assess our own actions, thoughts, and intentions. We realize that although we might be kind and smart in some ways, we also have room for growth. We recognize our tendency to exaggerate, avoid responsibility, or be less compassionate at times. Through the process of contemplating God's higher standards and honestly examining ourselves, we gain a truer understanding of who we are. We acknowledge our strengths and virtues, while also recognizing our flaws and areas for improvement. The idea of contemplating God before achieving true self-knowledge just that by recognizing a higher standard of virtue and goodness, individuals can gain a more accurate understanding of themselves. When we take time to reflect on qualities associated with a divine being, such as kindness, honesty, and humility, we begin to examine ourselves with a new perspective. This process leads to a deeper self-awareness, allowing us to acknowledge our strengths and flaws, and motivates us to grow and become better individuals. Contemplating the face of God serves as a lens through which we achieve true self-knowledge and strive to align ourselves with higher ideals. Second point in section two is, that Kelvin makes is the inherent human tendency to perceive ourselves as better than we truly are. For such as our innate pride, we always seem to ourselves just and upright and wise and holy until we're convinced by clear evidence of our injustice, violence, quality, and impurity. We often believe we are always right and rarely making mistakes. We will often boast about our achievements and likes, likes to show off our intelligence. We have a tendency to downplay or ignore our shortcomings, believing that because we don't do anything that merits jail time, we are just upright, wise, and morally superior to others. Now let's break down what this proclivity towards self-righteousness actually entails. Our self-perception illustrates how many people tend to view themselves in a positive light. We may believe we possess qualities like intelligence, kindness, or leadership skills and see ourselves as more virtuous than others. This self-perception leads to selective memory. We conveniently remember instances where we succeed, receive praise, or excel like academically. We might focus on positive feedback and dismiss or forget times when we struggle or make mistakes. This selective memory reinforces our belief in our own superiority, which causes us to ignore feedback. When receiving constructive criticism for others, we tend to become defensive or brush off the feedback. We find it challenging to accept criticism or acknowledge areas 
where we need to improve. And because of our self-importance and ignoring the criticism, we are often filled with a desire to impress others or to offset our imperfections. In social situations, we might exaggerate our accomplishments or tell stories that make us appear more impressive than we actually are. This desire to impress others contributes to an inflated self-image. This inflated self-image is only broken when reality hits us in the face with our feelings. As time goes on, we encounter situations where our knowledge is challenged or where we make errors. <clears throat> Perhaps we struggle with a challenging assignment, receive a lower grade on a test, or find ourselves in a conflict with a friend. Thus, when faced with clear evidence of their mistakes and shortcomings, we might feel embarrassed or disappointed. These moments force us to confront the reality that we are not as perfect or infallible as we once believed. As a result of these experiences, we start to realize that everyone makes mistakes and that we are not as faultless as we thought. This recognition leads to personal growth and humility as we learn to accept our imperfections and take responsibility for our actions. This inherent human tendency to perceive ourselves as better than we truly are is a common experience for everyone. Many individuals showcase their accomplishments, ignore criticism, and downplay their flaws. However, as life presents challenges and mistakes are made, individuals are confronted with the reality of their imperfections. These moments of clarity offer an opportunity for personal growth and humility as they come to understand that no one is perfect and acknowledging our weaknesses is an essential part to becoming a better and more self-aware person. <clears throat> The third point Kelvin makes is we need to rely on God as a standard of righteousness and virtue, where he says, convinced, however, we are not if we look to ourselves only, and not to the Lord also, he being the only standard by the application of which this conviction can be produced. We often consider ourselves a good person. We follow the rules, help people when they need it and don't go out of our way to hurt others. We believe that these actions are enough to make us a virtuous and righteous individual. Why is this wrong? We will often define our standards of righteousness and virtue based on our own actions and perceptions of what is right. We see ourselves as good because we follow certain rules and engage in positive behaviors. But this is a limited and incomplete view. Our perspective is limited to our own experiences and understanding of what is right and wrong. We may not fully comprehend the complexity of ethical dilemmas or the long-term consequences of our actions. When faced with challenging situations or moral dilemmas, we rely solely on our own judgment. We might not consider seeking guidance from external sources like religious teachings, ethical principles, or spiritual beliefs. Now, consider those who believe in God and follow a set of moral and ethical guidelines based on their faith. They look to the Lord's teaching for guidance in making decisions and assessing their own actions. Unlike those who do not believe, the faithful understand that their perspective alone may not encompass all aspects of righteousness and virtue. They seek higher wisdom by looking to God's standards, which provide provide a broader and more profound understanding of moral values. These values enable a greater capacity to evaluate actions. When faced with difficult choices, believers in God consult their faith and ethical beliefs. By comparing their actions to the principles taught by God, they gain a deeper understanding of whether their choices align with true righteousness and virtue. The faithful recognize that no one is perfect and they too have moments of weakness and shortcomings. However, by relying on God's standards, they learn to embrace their imperfections and work towards a growth and improvement. Through their faith, believers find strength and guidance to make decisions that align with values beyond their own limited understanding. They recognize the importance of relying on God's wisdom as a moral compass in navigating the complexities of life. 
the need to rely on God as a standard of righteousness and virtue is evident through the comparison of non-believers and the faithful perspectives. Non-believers who rely solely on their own understanding and actions may have a limited view of what it means to be righteous and virtuous. In contrast, the faithful embrace the importance of seeking higher wisdom through God's teachings. By looking to God as the ultimate source of guidance, they gain a broader and more profound understanding of moral values and humbly embrace their imperfections. This example highlights the significance of relying on God's standards as a way to navigate ethical dilemmas and strive for true righteousness and virtue. The fourth point Calvin makes in this section is the human inclination to settle for mere appearances of righteousness. For since we are not all naturally prone to hypocrisy, any empty semblance of righteousness is quite enough to satisfy us instead of righteousness itself. <clears throat> We will often try and present ourselves in the best light. We may be polite, well-mannered, and help out when needed. However, behind the scenes, we don't always live up to the way we want people to see us. Consider as an example the teacher's pet, the best student in the class. We'll call this teacher's pet Jonathan, because people named Jonathan tend to be jackasses. Jonathan has created an image of righteousness at school. He behaves well during class, raises his hand to answer questions, and participates actively in discussions. His teachers and peers perceive him as a conscientious and responsible student. However, unbeknownst to many, Jonathan might engage in less than righteous behaviors outside of school. For instance, he may gossip about others, make fun of classmates, or ignore his responsibilities at home. Jonathan's desire for approval and recognition from teachers and peers motivates him to maintain the appearance of righteousness. Being seen as a good student provides him with a sense of validation and acceptance. By focusing on surface actions and behaviors that appear righteous, Jonathan may neglect to address his internal values and intentions. His focus on looking good on the outside becomes more important than truly embodying righteousness. Instead of striving to be genuinely righteous and morally upright, Jonathan settles for a mere appearance of righteousness. As long as he can maintain the facade of a well-behaved student, he may feel satisfied, even if his true character doesn't align with that image. And Jonathan might not fully realize the consequences of his hypocrisy. By prioritizing appearances over authentic righteousness, he may intentionally harm his relationships with others and compromise his personal growth. In contrast, let's consider another classmate named Jacob. Jacob is well-liked by his peers and teachers, but his kindness and helpfulness are consistent both inside and outside of school. He genuinely cares for others and practices what he preaches. Jacob's actions are aligned with his values and beliefs. He doesn't seek recognition or approval for being righteous, Instead, he genuinely desires to make a positive impact on others' lives. Thus, we see that the human inclination to settle for mere appearances of righteousness can lead to hypocrisy, like in Jonathan's case. He prioritizes looking good on the outside to gain approval, but his true character doesn't consistently reflect righteousness. This tendency to emphasize surface actions over genuine values and intentions can hinder personal growth and lead to unintended consequences. In contrast, individuals like Jacob exemplify true righteousness by living their values consistently and genuinely caring for others without seeking recognition. The example of Jonathan and Jacob highlights the importance of aligning actions with values and moving beyond empty semblances of righteousness to embody true virtue and goodness. In the fifth point made by Calvin, the deceptive nature of human perception due to our inherent impurity. Since nothing appears within us or around us that is not tainted with very great impurity, so long as we keep our mind within the confines of human pollution, anything which is in some small degree less defiled belates us as if it were most pure, just as an eye to which nothing but black had been previously presented 
seems an object of a whitish or even brownish hue to be perfectly white. Going back to the example of the teacher's pet, imagine you have a classmate named Jonathan who believes they are always making the right decisions and acting with pure intentions. They tend to see the world and their actions in a positive light, often overlooking any flaws and impurities. Jonathan's perception of themselves and the world around them is influenced by their subjective viewpoint. They tend to interpret their actions and the actions of others based on their personal beliefs and experiences. When faced with situations where they make mistakes or act less than perfectly, Jonathan might downplay or overlook these imperfections. They might rationalize their actions or convince themselves that they didn't mean any harm. Similarity when observing the actions of others or the world around them, Jonathan might only focus on the positive aspects and ignore any flaws or impurities. They may believe that everything is mostly good and virtuous. Just as the quote mentions, the human perception can be like an eye that has only seen darkness. In such a scenario, when presented with a slightly lighter shade, it might be perceived as brilliantly white. For example, if Jonathan hears about someone who performed a small act of kindness, they might praise the person excessively, viewing them as incredibly virtuous, even if their overall character is more complex. When Jonathan reflects on their own ex actions, they may ignore or make excuses for any negative impact they had on others. They might believe that their intentions were good, so any negative consequences are minimized or dismissed. Jonathan's perception is influenced by their inherent impurity or bias, as is the case with all humans. This impurity affects their ability to see things objectively and leads them to misinterpret reality. Now consider another classmate named Lily. Lily is a more self-reflective and aware of her own imperfections. She acknowledges that everyone, including herself, has flaws and makes mistakes. Unlike Jonathan, Lily doesn't have a tendency to only focus on the positive aspects of people or situations. She takes a more realistic approach and understands everything has a mix of good and not-so-good qualities. <laughs> Lily's awareness of her own impurities and biases allow her to be more empathetic and understanding towards others. She recognizes that the deceptive nature of human perception requires continuous self-reflection and growth. The nature of human perception, influenced by our own inherent impurity, can lead to a distorted view of ourselves and the world around us, as seen in Jonathan's case. Jonathan's tendency to overlook imperfections and delight in small virtues demonstrates how our perception can be clouded by subjective biases. However, individuals like Willie, who acknowledge their imperfections and strive to see things more realistically, exemplify the importance of continuous self-reflection and growth. Understanding the deceptive nature of human perception helps us approach the world with greater humility and empathy, recognizing that our inherent impurity can affect our understanding of reality. In the sixth point, which continues to extrapolate from the previous one, the analogy of human perception being limited and insufficient when compared to the divine, Calvin wrote, nay, the bodily sense may furnish a still stronger illustration of the extent to which we are deluded in estimating the powers of the mind. If at midday we either look down to the ground or on the surrounding objects which lie open to our view, we think ourselves endued with a very strong and piercing eyesight. But when we look up to the sun and gaze at it unveiled, the sight which did exceed excellently well, for the earth is instantly so dazzled and confounded, by the refulgence, so as to oblige us to confess that her acuteness in discerning terrestrial objects is a mere dimness when applied to the sun. Imagine you and your friends are outside during a sunny day. You will decide to test your eyesight and see who can spot objects in the distance most accurately. As you look around, you notice your friends pointing out objects on the ground from the nearby surroundings. Everyone believes they have excellent eyesight because they can easily distinguish those objects. <clears throat> when someone suggests looking up the sun to see how clear your vision is, 
as you all direct your gaze towards the sun, you realize that your eyes are intensely dazzled and overwhelmed by the brightness. You can't see anything else clearly due to the intense refulgence of the sun. In this example, your ability to see terrestrial objects on the ground seemed quite impressive until you tried to look at something as radiant and powerful as the sun. The brightness of the sun reveals the limitations of your eyesight, making it evident that your acuteness in discerning terrestrial objects is a mere dimness when compared to the grandeur and brilliance of the sun. Likewise, the quote suggests that our human perception is limited and insufficient when compared to the divine. In the analogy, the sun represents the divine, and our eyesight represents our perception as human beings. As humans, we can perceive and understand the world around us to a certain extent. We can observe and analyze things based on our experience and knowledge. However, when it comes to understanding the vastity, vastness and complexity of the divine, our human faculties fall short. The divine is beyond the scope of our comprehension, just as looking directly at the sun overwhelms our vision. The analogy encourages us to recognize the limitations of our human perception and understanding. It humbles us, reminding us that the realms of knowledge and wisdom are beyond our grasp. Instead of trying to fully grasp the divine, the analogy encourages us to approach it with humility and reverence. Just as we cannot look directly at the sun without being dazzled, we should approach the divine with awe and respect for its greatness. The analogy of human perception being limited and insufficient when compared to the divine illustrates our understanding as humans fall short when we try to comprehend the vastness and greatness of the divine. Just as looking at the sun overwhelms our vision, seeking to fully understand the divine is beyond our capabilities. The analogy encourages us to approach the divine with humility and reverence, recognizing our human limitations and acknowledging that there are realms of wisdom and knowledge that surpass our comprehension. <clears throat> In the seventh point in this section, the self-deception resulting from focusing solely on earthly standards, thus to what happens in estimating our spiritual qualities. So long as we do not look beyond the earth, we are quite pleased with our own righteousness, wisdom, and virtue. We address ourselves in the most flattering terms and seem only less than demigods. Back to the example of the teacher's pet. Imagine your classmate named Jonathan believes he is morally superior because he follows the school rules, gets good grades, and is kind to his friends. He measures his virtues and righteousness solely based on his earthly actions and achievements. Jonathan's perception of his earthly qualities is influenced by earthly standards. He considers his adherence to school rules and academic success as indicators of his righteousness, wisdom, and virtue. Jonathan might not consider virtues like empathy, compassion, or humility, which are more abstract and not easily quantifiable in earthly terms. These deeper, deeper virtues are essential aspects of spiritual qualities that go beyond surface achievements. Since Jonathan focuses solely on his external accomplishments, he engages in flattering self-talk, believing he is morally superior to others. He may himself, see himself as a model student and might even compare himself to others if he were somewhat like a demigod. Jonathan's self-deception is partly fueled by external validation. If others praise him for his academic achievements or compliance with rules, he feels further validated in his belief of being morally superior. In this self-deceptive mindset, Jonathan might overlook his flaws or times when he has been unkind or insensitive. He may dismiss or rationalize his negative behaviors, focusing only on the positive aspects. Consider another classmate, Ethan who is also academically successful, but has a different perspective. Ethan believes he uh, believes that true spiritual qualities go beyond earthly achievements. Ethan considers virtues like humility, empathy, and integrity as crucial elements of his spiritual growth. He actively strives to be compassionate and supportive of his peers. Unlike Jonathan, Ethan's self-reflection goes beyond his academic accomplishments. He acknowledges areas where he needs improvement and actively works towards developing his deeper virtues. While Jonathan's self-perception is shaped by earthly standards, Ethan seeks to measure his spiritual qualities by external standard, by eternal standards of character and values. 
self-deception resulting from focusing solely on earthly standards, as seen in Jonathan's case, can lead to a distorted perception of one's spiritual qualities. By valuing only external achievements and overlooking deeper virtues, individuals might mistakenly believe they are morally superior. This self-deception is fueled by external validation and flattering self-talk. In contrast to individuals like Ethan, who recognize the importance of inner growth, embracing virtues like empathy, humility, and integrity, they understand that true spiritual qualities go beyond surface accomplishment and align their self-perception with eternal standards of character and values. This example highlights the significance of looking beyond earthly standards to develop a more holistic understanding of one's spiritual growth and character. Understanding this, we move on to the eighth point made by Kelp, the transformative effect of contemplating God's absolute righteousness and perfection on our own perceived righteousness and wisdom and virtue. We read, but should we once begin to raise our thoughts to God and reflect on what kind of being he is and how absolute the perfection of that righteousness and wisdom and virtue, to which as a standard we are bound to be conformed, formally delighted us by its false show of righteousness, we become polluted with the greatest iniquity. What's strangely imposed upon us under the name of wisdom will disgust by its extreme folly, and what presented the appearance of virtuous energy will be condemned as the most miserable impotence. <clears throat> so, using once again the example of that jackass, Jonathan, the self-righteous teacher's pet who prides himself on being morally upright, knowledgeable, and virtue, virtuous, he believes that he's wise beyond his years and will often boast about the good deeds and accomplishments. Jonathan's self-perception is built on their perceived righteousness, wisdom, and virtue. They view themselves as someone who has consistently makes right decisions and possesses superior knowledge and moral character. Now imagine Jonathan starts contemplating the idea of God and reflects on the divine qualities attributed to him, absolute righteousness, wisdom, and virtue. He begins to consider what it truly means to be morally perfect in all wise. Through this contemplation, Jonathan realizes that his own virtues are relative and fallible compared to the perfection of God's attributes. He sees how their righteousness, wisdom, and virtue, which once delighted him, pale in comparison to the divine standard. Jonathan recognizes that his perceived righteousness might sometimes be tainted by personal biases or self-interest. The wisdom, which once both, uh, believed to be profound, seems shallow compared to the vastness of divine wisdom. Contemplating God's wisdom exposes limitations of their own knowledge. They might identify past decisions or beliefs that, upon reflection, were not as wise as they once thought. <clears throat> as Jonathan internalizes the vastness and perfection of God's righteousness, wisdom, and virtue, they experience a transformative effect. The previous self-perception starts to shift. Instead of boasting about their righteousness, wisdom, and virtue, Jonathan becomes humbler and more open to learning and growth. They acknowledge they are on a journey towards becoming better and cannot attain divine perfection. While Jonathan knows they may never achieve God's absolute standard, they now strive to align their actions and beliefs with those virtuous qualities. They become more self -re more reflective and open to improving their character. Contemplating God's absolute righteousness and perfection has a transformative effect on our own perceived righteousness, wisdom, and virtue. Like Jonathan, individuals may initially see themselves as morally superior and wise, but reflecting on the divine standard reveals their inadequacies. This contemplation fosters humility and a desire for growth as they recognize their relative virtues in light of God's perfection. While they may never reach divine perfection, the transformative effect encourages them to align their actions and beliefs with virtuous qualities. The example of Jonathan illustrates the power of contemplating God's attributes and shaping our self-perception and fostering personal growth and humility. The ninth and final point Calvin makes in this section, the realization of the vast disparity between human qualities and the divine purity. So far, those, you know, so far as those qualities in us would seem most perfect, and corresponded to the divine purity. 
our example of Jonathan who prides himself on always doing the right thing and being morally a, a upright person. He strives to be kind, compassionate, and honest in his inter interactions with others. Jonathan's self-perception is based on the belief that he possesses qualities of kindness, honesty, and compassion, which he considers to be virtuous and admirable. Now let's consider the concept of divine purity, the idea that God is absolutely pure without any flaw and possesses perfect qualities like unconditional love, boundless compassion, and unwavering honesty. When Jonathan compares his own qualities to the ideal of divine purity, he begins to realize the vast disparity between his human virtues and the perfection of divine attributes. Jonathan recognizes that his kindness, though commendable, may sometimes come with conditions or be influenced by his mood or personal biases. He acknowledges that he is, his honesty might occasionally waver when faced with difficult situations. While Jonathan strives to be compassionate, he understands that his compassion is limited by his human emotions and capacity to understand the depths of others' pain or struggles. <clears throat> Contemplating the concept of divine purity helps Jonathan realize that, as a human being, he is inherently flawed and limited in his ability to embody absolute purity and perfection. Instead of feeling discouraged by this realization, Jonathan embraces his imperfections as part of being human. He recognizes that the ideal of divine purity sets a standard that he can continually aspire to, but may never fully achieve. Rather than seeing the disparity between human qualities and divine purity as a discouragement, Jonathan uses it as a catalyst for personal growth. He understands that he can continually work on improving his virtues and aligning his actions with the divine standard. The realization of the vast disparity between human qualities and the divine purity as experienced by Jonathan brings about humility and self-awareness as it reflects on the perfection of divine attributes he recognizes that his own imperfections and limit, limitations as a human being. This realization does not diminish the value of his virtues, but encourages him to continually strive for growth and improvement. Jonathan embraces his humanity while aspiring to align his actions and qualities with the divine standard of purity. This example highlights the importance of recognizing and humbly accepting the gap between human qualities and divine attributes while using it as motivation for personal growth and spiritual development. <clears throat> In the quest for truth, we seek to know ourselves. Yet blind to our flaws, pride paints a rosy view. We think we're just, wise, holy, and upright. Until clear evidence re reveals our vileness. To see the truth, we must look to the Lord. His standard alone guides our conviction. For appearances can deceive our sight. Hypocrisy may cloak itself as righteousness. And with shallow virtue we settle. A mere facade can satisfy our souls. But deep within impurity lies concealed. Our tainted minds perceive the world askew. Like eyes that claim keen sight on earthly things, yet gaze upon the sun revealing dimness. So our perception falls short of the divine. When focused only on this mortal plane, with flattery we dress our righteousness. As demigods, we bask in shallow praise. But raise your thoughts to God, behold this face, absolute perfection, wisdom, virtue's grace. As we contemplate his resplendent light, false shows of righteousness turn into sin. Wisdom's pretense reveals its empty guise, virtuous energy exposed as weak and futile. In ourselves, we chase what seems perfect, yet divine purity eludes our grasp. No match are we for God's flawless glory. Humility dawns as we recognize our earthly traits fall short of his great love, and in this humbling, we find his grace. Through Kelvin's words, this lesson he imparts, to seek true self-knowledge, we must start with contemplation of the face of God. His standard of righteousness and virtue is rod. For earthly views deceive and pride denies the vast disparity twixt God and I. In Institutes of Faith, Chapter 1, we explore Section 2, unveils wisdom's sacred door. 
kept on Calvin's approach, a beacon burning bright, I'd seek her through the realms of divine light, from self to God the journey's path disgraced, two parts entwined by threads of truth embraced. First knowledge of ourselves, the introspection deep, a mirror held our flaws and virtues too deep. Yet as we gaze, our eyes are drawn above, to God our source of life, a fount of love, the extremes that lead to an eternal sea. Our blessings blow the current pure and free. The human plate from Adam's fall we see. A vast, a ruin vast, a lost humanity. In our distress, we turn our eyes above, aware of need of God's redemptive love. Our misery reveals a truth profound. In God alone, true wisdom can be found. From ignorance to vanity we roam. In weakness, want, and sin we find no home. But through this darkness shines a gleam of grace. A call to seek, a yearn for God's embrace. Our discontent drives us to upward gaze, as fallen souls seek wisdom, guiding rays. In poverty of spirit we confess, in God resides our truest blessedness. From our own evil good we strive to know, a journey toward the light from depths below, through turmoil, doubt, and struggles that we face. We are drawn to God, our refuge and our base. Thus self-awareness leads to God's embrace, a dance of hearts, a sacred interlace. In seeking him, we find our souls made whole, his wisdom, virtue, shaping heart and soul. So let us journey forth with open eyes, from self to God, where truest wisdom lies. Institutes of the Christian religion, first chapter's plea, section two unfolds a path for all to see. John Calvin's words of deep and strong and clear, Guiding hearts to God, dispelling doubt and fear. Through knowledge of ourselves, we find the key to contemplate God's light, unshackled and free. Until next time, follow after Jesus, who is the way.